the only shooting stick with one-handed trigger pull adjustments, has a new way to keep you at the top of your game. The Trigger Stick Apex, built for sturdy support that adapts to unforgiving terrain with easy adjustments to make your big shots. With our Durasteady three-piece carbon leg design and interchangeable rock-solid clamp, nothing tops the Apex. The Trigger Stick Apex, only from Primo's. If you hunt enough, you learn the truth. What you seek speaks a language and knows it well. That's why every Primo's call for everything you hunt is made the right way. We sweat every detail so you get more out of every hunt and nothing leaves our hand until we know it'll work in yours. Because we don't just make the world's best calls, we speak the language. Primo's. Welcome to the Casting Across Fly Fishing Podcast. I'm Matthew of castingacross.com, where I explore the quarry and culture of fly fishing. This is the 245th episode of the podcast, being recorded outside of beautiful Charlottesville, Virginia. Uh, Charlottesville is a phenomenal area for food, for drink, for history, and for fishing. Central Virginia has so many opportunities when it comes to the outdoors, particularly angling. Uh, there's large rivers that have smallmouth and muskie in them. There are rivers that have lots of trout up in the mountains. And then as you go down the slopes, then there's spring creeks that have trout. But what I've been doing primarily as I've been on a little family trip for the last few days is fishing for largemouth and ponds. It's what is most accessible to me at this moment, and I'm having a lot of fun doing it, and I'm able to do it with my kids and with my uh, nephews and nieces. And so it's been a lot of fun, and it's gotten me thinking uh, about how I approach fishing for largemouth with a fly rod. And if you started as a bass angler and you picked up fly fishing uh, from that, then you're probably in a really good position to know how to fly fish for bass well. But if you started fly fishing and you then wanted to incorporate fishing for bass or other warm water species into your repertoire, then there may be a few hangups. There may be a few things that you need to get figured out to really be successful. So that's going to be the theme of uh, today's podcast. Really, a, a couple of ways where you can make some changes uh, to be a better bass angler, to be better prepared to be a bass angler with a fly rod, especially if you're coming from fly fishing for trout. Um, and so I'll talk about some of those transitions and things that might require a little bit of, of effort and thought and deliberate action on your part if that is a transition that you're making. Uh, so there's a lot of ways that we could talk about this. And I would say the most important thing is you need to know how to read water. That's beyond the scope of what I'm going to discuss. Um, this is assuming you know how to read a pond. It's assuming you know how to read a river. Um, and a lot of times, you know, you're going to find fish in the where places you find fish. I mean, with the exception of a few species, you know, catfish are going to be in a certain place, um, you know, but uh, bass are going to be in similar places that you would find trout, especially in moving water. Uh, they occupy different environments, uh, you know, slower, warmer water versus faster, colder water in a, as an, a generalization, but they're going to be in the same spots. They're going to want the more oxygenated water. And then when you get to uh, still water, you're going to find them at drop-offs. You're going to find them in weed beds. A lot of these fish are, are carnivorous and they are hunters. They are opportunistic. And so they're going to hang out in places where they can be disguised, but also in a place where bait fish is going to find their way to it. Uh, I'm already talking kind of too much about that, but you need to know how to read water and how to make presentation. Um, some of the, one of the best ways you can learn about how to present a fly to a bass is to watch a professional bass angler, uh, with their big shiny glittery boat and their, you know, uh, three casts a minute approach to throwing, uh, lures at bass. Uh, they're presenting, f uh, lures in the way that you need to present your fly, which I guess is probably the, the, one of the points I'll, I'll cover today. So not going to talk about that so much today, not going to also talk about uh, species because I'm focusing on largemouth and a lot of the information, particularly as it relates to gear, can be equally applicable when it comes to smallmouth or spotted bass or shoal bass or any other uh, black bass that is going to be uh, kind of in, in this, this family of fish. So the very first thing to kind of get into it uh, is, and this might be hard for a trout angler, uh, use bigger gear than you think you need. 
use bigger gear than you think you need. So on this pond that I'm fishing, I don't anticipate catching a five pound bass. I might, and I'd be more than happy to do that. Um, but these, these are going to be kind of more, more average size bass that I'm going to be catching, but still I'm using an eight weight. So, I mean, I use an eight weight for some of my lighter, uh, kind of topwater striper fishing on the, on the coast. So I'm catching big, hard fighting ocean fish on an eight weight. But why am I using that for, you know, panfish and bass on a medium sized lake in, in Virginia? It has everything to do with the fly and very little to do with the fish. For years and years and years, I threw six weights for bass, and I still will. There's times when I throw six weights for bass when I'm fishing in a place where I know uh, I'm going to be able to fish like dry flies uh, for bass, especially for smallmouth bass. I'll I'll use a six weight because I know the size of the fly that I'm throwing, uh, and and the difference between a six weight and an eight weight, as far as the what you're gonna feel when you're fighting a fish, is kind of minimal. I mean, I've, I've caught some panfish in the last few days that have bent over my rod and have been fun to pull in. Now, would they have been more fun to pull in on a two weight? Of course. But would I have been able to throw the popper that I was throwing if I had a two weight? Absolutely not. And this is, I think, again, the big hang up. We try to use the lightest tackle possible. And we the benefit that we receive from throwing a light rod is that you feel that fish very well. But really, when it comes down to it, the true benefit that you get from throwing a light rod is the presentation. You can oftentimes make a more delicate presentation when you lose a, use a lighter rod. Um, and you will notice that there's a significant increase in the delicate nature of the presentation that you can make with a live three weight than you can with a more rigid five weight. And you're also going to notice that thing bend over a little bit more. But if we want to be nice to our fish, especially fish in warmer weather, we want to get them in as quickly as possible. It doesn't mean that we don't want to derive any pleasure as we reel or pull this fish in, strip this fish in, but there's not going to be that enough of a difference to justify dropping down a few line weights uh, simply so that rod bends over more because you're going to lose your ability to cast for distance and cast for accuracy. And you're also not going to really have to worry about the presentation because a lot of these flies, you're going to want them to actually make a noise when they land, especially if you're fishing top water patterns. But with that said, I think an eight weight is a great weight for bass. Uh, if you have a seven weight, now a lot of people have a seven weight, but if you have a seven weight, a seven weight is a spectacular uh, rod weight for bass. And it all comes down to not just the uh, length of the cast that you're making and not just the size of the flies that you're fishing, but the aerodynamic nature or lack thereof the flies that you are casting. So what do I mean by that? Well, you can have a really large wet streamer that when it comes out of the water, it is streamlined because all those fibers, whether they be natural, synthetic, whether they be feathers or whether they be fur, they are going to be slicked back. So although the thing is heavy, it is not going to really have much wind resistance as it's flying through the air as you're making a cast. But when you're fishing something like a big popper or even a big slider, or if you're fishing a Dahlberg diver, I've been fishing one of those the last few days, a big cupped face deer hair pattern that is not going to have any manipulation because of the water at all. It's a very rigid design. And so when that thing's up in the air, you know, could I throw something of that weight with a five weight? Absolutely. Could I throw something of that size with a five weight? Of course. But something that is not going to become streamlined as it comes out of the water and is wet is going to be very, very difficult to bomb out at 60 feet from a seated position in a canoe. And you want the casting to be fun. You don't want it to be a chore. There's a lot of casting that you can do, whether free bass or trout or whatever. And it's from a pragmatic standpoint, you can get it done. But you want it to be pleasurable or you want it to at least be something you don't even notice. And so jumping up to something like an eight weight is a great thing to do. Now, based upon your flies, this could be that you've been using that four weight to fish little poppers and little streamers, and a six weight might be a better option. Um, and, you know, if you're fishing sinking lines and you're still throwing really large weighted articulated flies for bass, and you've been using the seven weight, then maybe jumping up to a nine weight isn't a bad idea. Because once you do get in from those bigger fish, it's you're not going to care if it's a seven versus a nine or six versus an eight. Uh, you're going to be happy that you're able to get that fly in front of it. And I think that's the next thing. So firstly, uh, you want to make sure that you are using a rod that is weighted uh, appropriately for casting big uh, non-aerodynamic flies. 
The second one is you want to fish big flies, be they aerodynamic or not. So I've heard different things that largemouth bass will chase prey half their size, that largemouth bass will prey, chase prey three quarters of their size. I'm not sure what it is. I just know that big bass will chase lots and lots of fish. That uh, a fish, whether it be a trout imitation or a panfish imitation or even a baby duck imitation, um, as long as it is acting in a way that makes it look like an easy meal, those bass are going to go after it and they're going to ask questions later. So again, taking cues from the professional bass world and from the trophy bass fishing world, which is really a, a fascinating uh, niche in bass fishing that is very large compared to fly fishing, but is uh, still just a niche. You look at some of the lures they're using, these swim baits that are meant to replicate trout, and they're 8 and 12 inches long because guys are shooting for bass that are in excess of 20 inches long, and so an 8-inch lure is nothing for that bass because you think of a 20-inch bass. I know they're not often you know, measured in inches. They're meant measured in pounds at that point, but you consider the size of that thing's mouth. An eight inch uh, trout is nothing. Whether that take that fish takes in that trout head first, tail first, or completely from the side, it, that bass will have no problem inhaling that entire trout. And so that's what a lot of these guys are using to chase after these large trophy pound bass as they're pursuing those 20 plus pound fish. Well, you might not have that kind of opportunity in your area, but that same mentality can be brought to your fly selection. The giant, enormous, hideous streamers and topwater flies are wonderful options to chase after big bass. And this actually, I think, is a shortcoming for a lot of people is that they say, you know what? I only catch panfish. I only catch little stuff. I, I, you know, they, these little bluegill keep jumping up and taking my fly. Well, then double the size of your popper, triple the size of your popper, throw a popper that looks like a golf ball with some feathers hanging off the back of it. You aren't going to be able to catch those panfish anymore. You're not going to be able to catch those small bass, but you are going to be throwing the kind of flies that are going to be eliciting the strikes from the large bass. And for bass, like any any other fish, especially as you get into the doldrums of summer, everything is an equation that they run in their primitive little brains. Is the amount of energy I'm going to have to expend to chase this food justified by the amount of food I'm going to receive? And so if they are seeing you throw a size, you know, four or size six uh, foam popper with a couple little three inch feathers hanging off the back, they might say, eh, I'm going to pass on this. But if they see this giant, you know, mouse looking thing bounce across the lily pads, that's something that they just know they can't give up because this thing looks lost. This thing looks wounded. This thing looks like it's an easy meal. So they're going to go after it. So again, you're going to need a larger rod to throw this, but don't be afraid to throw those large patterns. Um, I think this is one of the things that I've had to overcome the most in my life is I always think, oh my goodness, this fly is enormous. This fly is huge. It fills up my fly box. It's as long as my hand. But when you want to catch those bass that are, you know, 16, 18, 20 inches, then that is precisely what you need to throw. And that's a normal size fish for a lot of water bodies in, the, in our country. Um, that is a normal size good fish. And you look at the size of the spinner baits and the rubber worms and the swim baits that people are using to catch fish on your local water bodies, and you can have flies that match that. It can be simple as a deceiver. It can be as uh, complicated as a game changer and anything in between. Whatever fly you choose to use, don't be afraid to go up a size. Uh, now, if you are out for simply getting numbers, and you don't mind getting those 8 and 10 and 12 inch fish, then you probably need to keep it more scaled back to like a 6 inch fly. But don't don't think an 8 inch or a 10 inch fly is going to be something that makes it so that you're never going to catch anything because that thing in the water is going to elicit strikes from fish. So to keep the theme going, I talked about using larger rods, rod weights, I should say, uh, larger flies. And then the third thing is having a larger weighted rod allows you to throw a weighted line better. And this is incredibly important if you're fishing a water body that is either a quicker uh, river or a lake that gets deep especially as things get warmer or if there are fish that are holding off of structure that are in deeper water. Being able to throw a weighted line is so important when it comes to fishing still waters, whether it be reservoirs or lakes or um, even even slow-moving uh, rivers. So, for example, uh, one of the places I fish in New Hampshire quite a bit for bass is a river. It's just impounded a couple miles downstream, and so it's just a very, very slow river. Most folks think, think it's a pond. 
and being able to fish it with a sinking line is the key to success once the days start getting warmer, especially the middle of the day. Of course, everyone wants to fish topwater. Everyone wants to fish poppers. Having a bass strike a popper at the end of a fly rod is one of the best things that you can do. I mean, it, it rivals a little dry fly set by a trout, right? But in the heat of the day, when the sun is shining high, it's just not the time where, where you're going to have a, a ton of success in this in most places. So to be able to fish to where the fish are is really, really helpful. So carrying a bigger leader wallet or a bigger head wallet maybe um and some bigger heads or even some bigger spools of of fly line is a great thing to do so right now i'm fishing two spools i have a floating bass line and then i have a weighted eight weight line and switching back and forth with those is a little bit of work but it's also better than compromising getting your fly in front of those fish and I've said it before, I would much rather fish a weighted line with an unweighted fly than an unweighted line with a weighted fly. Now, again, in a, in a pinch, when you have to simply get something on there, then throwing on that weighted fly on that floating fly line, it's going to work. But if all things are equal, I want to fish a weighted line with an unweighted fly. Uh, I'm going to be in much better control of my line than I am of my fly. That's part of why we fly fish. Um, I'm going to know where that fly is because there's not necessarily a hinge point where that fly is sinking down at a rate greater than my fly line, but my fly line is probably pulling that fly down uh, at a rate that's commensurate with how it is sinking. Um, but also it is going to be a more consistent sink rate. If you're fishing with a floating line and even if you're using a poly leader, which are great and they're clutch. And again, I would rather fish the floating line, a poly leader and an unweighted fly than a floating line and a weighted fly. But being able to do that uh, allows a more consistent uh, sink rate. And as you make those strips to make your presentation, that fly is not going to rise up in the water column as much as it would if you had a floating fly line and even a weighted fly. So, I, so to restate, my priority order is uh, weighted fly line, unweighted fly, floating fly line, poly leader, unweighted fly, Following fly line, weighted fly. That is my priority list and, and how I fish like this. I had to think about that for a second. But again, it's a heavier fly line, but it is it is designed to be cast. So you're actually going to have a better cast with a weighted fly line, a sinking fly line, or even an intermediate fly line or a sink tip fly line than you would with that floating fly line, that poly leader, that floating fly line, and that weighted fly. And again, what does this do? One, it does everything I said before as far as being in contact with that fly. But secondly, it is going to make your casts more accurate and give them more distance. And over an entire day, as you're throwing something heavy, whether it be a weighted line on a six weight or a weighted line on an eight weight, having something that casts easier is going to be very, very beneficial because you're going to stay on your game. You're not going to be distracted and you're not going to be fatigued. So to summarize, bigger rods, heavier rods, heavier weighted rated rods, uh, bigger flies, and bigger fly lines. Um, we might try to get away with less uh, in fly fishing, especially if you're fishing smaller waters for trout or you're fishing uh, waters that require a very delicate touch for trout, then that is the way to go. But when you are throwing big flies, because big flies turn into big fish, especially when you're talking about warm water fish, um, and that's almost the rule. Like with trout, that's kind of, it's an, an option. You catch lots of big fish on little dry flies, lots of big fish on nymphs, uh, lots of big fish on subtle streamers, but you also can catch a lot of fish on big streamers. With bass, that's not necessarily the case. You will catch a largemouth bass every once in a while on a small lure uh, or a small fly, but more often than not, you're going to catch your big warm water fish, your big black bass on larger flies. And so to fish them effectively, you need a heavier weight rated rod and heavier fly lines. So going bigger really is better for bass and getting it out of your mind that you need something lightweight, something that's going to double over when you catch a fish. You don't want to overdo it. You don't want to throw something that's scary. That stuff needs to just push, be pushed out of your mind. Um, you can throw those eight inch flies. They will catch fish. It's not going to be ridiculous. If, if there are no fish that are of that size in the lake, then just do what is commensurate to where you're fishing. But this is going to yield a lot of fish. Um, if you've ever wanted to toy around with streamers, then this is the time to do it. 
And, you know, as you get be very comfortable with fishing in this style of fishing with larger flies, with larger gear for bass, and you get that reward of understanding how to fish these things, not necessarily for bass, but just how to manipulate the fly, how to cast the line, how to use that fly rod, then you will maybe be more comfortable to using heavier gear to go after trout if you want to give streamer fishing a chance. Because again, there's a lot of guys these days who are fishing very large flies for trout using very heavy rods. Um, and it would be an easier transition for them to move over to fishing for bass. But if you are in the traditional, you know, four, five, six weight uh, world, uh, fishing mostly dry flies and nymphs and a few streamers for trout, then it can be a harder jump to fish for bass. But there's so much reward in this. Um, it's not only fun, but it's also another option that's probably more readily available for more people across the country. It's something that's there as the days get warmer and the trout are, are going to get uh, a little bit stressed out and maybe you shouldn't even be chasing them. And uh, it gives you an option, you know, if you have a subdivision, if you have a golf course, now you can fish for bass and they grow big. The carrying capacity for most of these small ponds is pretty remarkable when it comes to warm water fish. And so as long as there's a good forage source of shad or of uh, minnows or of, uh, you know, even uh, trout or, or sunfish, then these bass are going to get big. So you can chase after them with big flies and have a lot of fun catching big, hard fighting, hard hitting bass with your fly rod. This week on castingacross.com, two articles as per usual, and the first one is called um, Ed Flea and Me Part 3. So this is the third part of what is probably going to be a four-part uh, uh, series uh, talking about a new fly rod that I was able to pick up in South Central Pennsylvania, a custom rod from Ed Shank. So this is the third part of the article. Uh, Wednesday's article is called Gone Fishing for a Minute. And uh, although I'm recording this podcast right now, um, I am still on vacation. And this um, episode was about the fact that I am on vacation. So you can read about that and the very few inspirational things that I have to share. This week's recommendation on the podcast is a pair of shorts, all right? Uh, so a good pair of shorts is a very, very good thing to have, especially when it comes to uh, wet wading or, or hiking or moving around uh, in, in the woods. Uh, so a pair of shorts I have come to really like is from EMS, uh, Eastern Mountain Sports, and they're the Meridian Pull-On Shorts. So there is no belt loops. Um, and there is, uh, they, they are a relatively short inseam. I think they are something like, uh, um, 11, no, seven, in, seven inches. I'm looking at the listing right now and they come in, uh, like basically yellow, blue, and red. So the primary colors, right? Um, but, uh, they're quick dry. Uh, they're wicked comfortable. They are antimicrobial. They have UPF properties to them. So they're just great all-around shorts for kicking around as well as wearing outside. I've been hiking in them. I've been fishing in them. And it's just a good pair of shorts. Uh, I'm sure you could find something else that is like this, but this is what I found. So I thought I'd pass it along. So I'll put a link to the EMS Meridian pull-on shorts. They're drawstring, by the way, no belt loops, uh, in the show notes to this podcast page over at castingacross.com. Thanks for listening to the Casting Across Fly Fishing Podcast. Please subscribe to your favorite podcast app and rate the podcast in iTunes. Then head over to castingacross.com for three posts a week on the people, places, and things that go into the pursuit of fish. that has the stories to back it a life to be proud of it's a winchester life yeah baby six eight western oh, i'll be over there baby right there tune in every tuesday at 7 p.m eastern on waypoint tv